There we go. Now we're really ready to go. Sorry for the technical difficulties we've had. One day Jesus was eating at Matthew's house. Who was Matthew? You remember Matthew? Tax collector. And this tax collector had a bunch of his friends at his house to meet Jesus. And the religious leaders did not like the tax collectors at all. And then during that meal, during that visit, Jesus says, those who are healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick do. And he says that he had come to call sinners to repentance. It's in your study guide, hopefully be on the screen for you in just a moment. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. Does that include us? You and me? We? Of course it does. There's a training book for elders called the Elder's Handbook. And in there is a quotation, if uh, my team can help us get to that slide. I want to show you this quotation from the book. Next one. There we go. It says, Do not be surprised or discouraged by the number of unloving people in your congregation. Sick people are not out of place in a hospital. It is where they get well. Unloving people are not out of place in the church. It is where they learn to love. Interesting quotation, isn't it? On our own, we are all sick, aren't we? The church should be like a hospital, a place where sinners can come, where we can come and get well. We can be healed by the great physician, Jesus Christ. We can be healed of our sick and our unloving characters. Like we talked about in Sabbath school, of our impatience. We can learn to be patient. We can learn to have the fruits of the Spirit through Jesus Christ. Even people we think of in the Bible as Bible heroes were sinners who struggled and sometimes made very wrong choices. Peter is one example I want us to consider, and I want us to look at his story in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew what chapter? 26. And I put it up on the screen for you, but it's good to see it in your own Bible if you have it. Matthew 26, verse 35. Peter said to Jesus, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. What a declaration. What a commitment. But then we have to read the rest of the story. The few verses that follow, notice what happens. Then Jesus came to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and, two, and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And said to who? Peter, who had just pledged that he would even die with Peter. So now Jesus goes, hey, wake up. Peter, I'm talking to you. What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Not even one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, 
but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Can you relate to Peter at all? Who boldly pronounces he's never going to deny Jesus. Never, ever, ever. He'll even die with him. And then the next scene, this time of deep sorrow for Jesus, when Jesus wanted his disciples to be watching with him and praying with him, including Peter. He's one of the three, one of the inner circle of Jesus. Peter's sleeping in dreamland. But for Peter, this sleeping, while it's bad, it gets much worse. After Jesus is taken captive, Peter ends up cautiously following and he enters the courtyard of the high priest near to where Jesus was going through this mockery of a trial. Peter had just been with Jesus for the last three and a half years of ministry. He had been personally mentored by the Savior. He saw God in the flesh. And when the going got tough, he denied that he even knew Jesus. Not just once, not just twice, but three times he says, I don't know him. And then he heard the rooster crow. And he remembered what Jesus had told him before, that when, before the rooster crowed twice, he would deny him three times. And Peter left weeping, crying, ashamed. Peter was not perfect. He needed to spiritually grow and mature. After Jesus' resurrection, we see Peter in a whole different way. Somehow he is changed, he is transformed. After Jesus restores him to ministry, you remember the story? Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep, Jesus says. He does this three times. Jesus restores Peter to ministry. And we see a transformation of character in Peter's life. And this transformation that he does for Peter, he also wants to do with you and me. And this transformation process is a lifelong process. Let me share with you some quotations here from Ellen White. She says, sanctification is not the work of a moment, an hour, a day, but of a lifetime. It is not gained by a happy flight of feeling, but is the result of constantly dying to sin and constantly living for Christ. Let me use some of my Arabic again. Kill yom. Every day. Kill sa'ah. Every hour. Kill fikra. Every thought. We need to constantly live for Christ. That means every day, every hour, every thought. It's a lifelong thing, constant dependence upon Jesus. She continues, none of the apostles and prophets ever claimed to be without sin. Men who have lived the nearest to God 
men who would sacrifice life itself rather than knowingly commit a wrong act, men whom God has honored with divine light and power have confessed the sinfulness of their nature. They have put no confidence in the flesh, have claimed no righteousness of their own, but have trusted wholly in the righteousness of Christ. That's what we need to do also. She says, she continues, so it will be with all who behold Christ. The nearer we come to Jesus and the more clearly we discern the purity of his character, the more clearly shall we see the exceeding sinfulness of sin and the less we shall feel like exalting ourselves. And then again, she says, there will be a continual reaching out of the soul after God, a continual Every day, every hour, every thought, continual, earnest, heartbreaking confession of sin and humbling of the heart before him. At every advanced step in in our Christian experience, our repentance will deepen. Have you thought about that before? Have you ever seen that quote before? So we usually think, ah, when we get baptized, that's when we're really serious about repentance because now we're getting baptized. We want to repent of all of our sins, have them washed away. But at every advanced step in our Christian experience, our repentance will deepen. So if you were baptized 20 years ago like I was, I was more than that now, 24 years ago maybe, my repentance now should be deeper than it was then. Because hopefully I'm closer to Jesus now than I was back then. And hopefully the same is true for you. That you're growing closer to him. And your repentance will deepen. All of us are like Peter. On our own, without Christ, we are weak and sinful. We make wrong choices. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But Jesus came to save people like us. Peter was one of the apostles of Jesus Christ. God used him to work in the early church. He was a pioneer of the early church. And one lesson we can learn from him is apart from Christ, disconnected from Christ, We do what we know we shouldn't do. Apart from Christ, we fall asleep spiritually and we neglect to be the friends that he wants us to be. We're sleeping when we should be praying. Apart from Christ, like Peter, we curse, we swear, and we even deny that we know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. But with Christ, everything changes. Notice Peter's testimony from 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Praise the Lord for that testimony from Peter's own life. It's especially powerful to understand that text when we understand Peter's fallen nature. His falling to temptations again and again. So when he says this, he's saying his own testimony. God knows how to rescue me from temptations. And if he can rescue me, Peter, with my big mouth that claims to be courageous for God, but when the going gets tough, I deny him. If he can rescue me, he can rescue you. Here's one final quotation from Ellen White. She says, There is apparent that nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible, than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on the merits of the Savior. God would send every angel in heaven to the aid of such a one rather than to allow him or to allow her to be overcome. Wow. I hope, friends, you'll take that study guide home, 
Get that quotation on your phone, take a picture of it, do whatever you need to do to remember it. On our own, me, you, on our own, we are helpless. We need to feel our nothingness because disconnected from God, we can do nothing. But if we are connected with him, if we are depending on him, which that's what she's saying, when we are helpless, helpless means we cannot help ourselves. Do you realize that? You are helpless. I am helpless. We can't help ourselves. Even the goodness of God is what leads us to repentance. We can't even repent on our, on our own. He leads us to that. We are helpless on our own. But with him, we are invincible. I hope each one of us can realize that today. To feel our nothingness and to rely and depend fully on Christ and on his merits. Because when we do that, we are invincible. Amen. As we move into our foot washing time, I want us to read a short passage from the Gospel of John. Jesus said, John 13, verses 14 and 15, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. That's why we practice foot washing, because of what Jesus has taught us. Not just by his words, but by his actions. So, most of you are familiar with how we do this. We have two rooms downstairs, one for the ladies, one for the gentlemen, where we can find a partner and wash each other's feet, humbly serving each other. But as we get ready to go down there, if there's somebody in this room Maybe you've done something wrong. You've had an argument, a disagreement, a fight. Why don't you try to make it right as you head down to the foot washing? Go make an apology. Ask forgiveness. That you can experience each other's forgiveness as we are reminded of the forgiveness Jesus provides us through the cross.